After reading Tozer this morning, or today, I should say, I began to think about, I'd like to write a book, you know, I've, I've written books before, but I'd like to write a book called Grace for Grace, you know, Chuck kind of, Chuck Smith has kind of really grabbed a hold of, you know, the essence of grace and and what God has done in his book, um, Why Grace Changes Things, and really it's a beautiful title, but I'd really like to write one about why and how God gives grace for grace and why we need to be careful of how and what we do with our actions, our words, our deeds and the very life that we're living because we may be misrepresenting God in some ways, sometimes and I don't mean by grace so much so as by some of the theological ideas that men and women have when they get into denominations and seek to try to supposedly clean up the church or clean up their act by putting certain boundaries and parameters upon people that God may not have told them to do and they may be representing God in a way that doesn't make God visible of who he really is and what he is and Tozer brings that out today so let's read it Tozer and see if we can get a handle on this so we understand what he's trying to say the wickedness of unbelief making God a liar he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. 1 John 5.10 You know, that to me, just right there, that line automatically boggles my mind in a sense of, Wow, he that believes not God has made him a liar. Whoa. You know, I kind of have to stop with that there and think about it for a few minutes like what do you mean if you don't believe God I mean a lot of people you know they always say well if I just knew that God existed well what if you did and then God spoke to you but then you didn't believe you see Romans says that at some point in time every man has known God and changed the image of the incorruptible God into the image of the corruptible man so I suspect you or me have known or has known at some point in time in our life some encounter with God in some way shape or form and yet we rejected somehow what God was saying to us by doubt or unbelief we refused to believe in what he was saying and that made God a liar and I don't think that would be a good position to be in to be representing God as a liar so I find it very interesting that First John is very blunt about it in saying that because he believed not the record that God gave of his son, we have to accept that God said, this is my beloved son, whom I will please listen to him. We accept if we are Christian, meaning that we're made unto the likeness of Jesus himself, that we must accept that that is what God intended for us to be like his son which to me makes only perfect sense but some people actually don't accept that and if they don't accept God's testimony of his own son then whose testimony would they take how would you believe true faith must always rest upon what God is so it is of utmost importance that to the limit of our comprehension we know what he is what is God? Well, I know one scripture says God is love. The psalmist said, They that know thy name will put their trust in thee. The name of God being the verbal expression of his character. And confidence always rises or falls with known character. God is love. We know that God, we call him Abba, Father. Now, you could call him the God of righteousness, the God of wrath, the God of this, the God of that, the God of every other thing, and you may be partially accurate. But is that a true representation of who God is? I think when Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, and telling his disciples, have I been so long with you that you do not know me? I suspect that God is what we see Jesus as. When the psalmist said was simply that they who know God to be the kind of God he is will put their confidence in him, 
This is not a special virtue, but the normal direction any mind takes when confronted with the fact. We are so made that we trust good character and distrust its opposite. And that is why unbelief is so intensely wicked. The character of God, then, is the Christian's final ground of assurance and solution of many, if not most, of his practical religious problems. In, <laughs> it's funny that they said that in, in uh, Tozer, because in teaching on principles of life, one of the first things we defined in the conflicts that we run into as human beings is our definition of God. How we define God often determines our personal relationship in every other area of the world. Everything that we do is influenced by how we define God. Because as we define a, a God, as we define God as He is, as we define that relationship that we have to have as He being creator and we being creation, and that there is a relationship there, whether we acknowledge it or not, if we are in denial, then that will affect every other relationship that we are involved in. So our relationship to our children, our wives, our family, our neighbors, our country, if it isn't already predicated upon a proper understanding of God, then those relationships will be affected. So we study that in Principles of Life, a very interesting concept that you must have a proper definition of who God is, how he operates, and what God is. Otherwise, every other relationship that you have will be affected and you may be distorted or contorted in trying to solve relationship problems when the essence boils down to an improper knowledge of God himself. Sometimes you, people put the cart before the horse and don't realize that the horse is meant to pull the cart, not the cart pull the horse. Makes perfect sense once you think about it. The character of God, then, is the Christian's final ground of assurance. Though God dwells in the center of eternal mystery, there need be no uncertainty, certainty, certainty about how he will act in any situation covered by his promises. These promises are infallible predictions. God will always do what he has promised to do when his conditions are met. If he said it, he will do it. He's not a man that he should lie. And his warnings are no less predictive. In other words, you will reap what you sow, and if you have done something that God has said don't do, you will suffer the consequences. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, from Psalms 1.5. We cultivate our knowledge of God, and at the same time cultivate our faith. Yet while so doing, we look not at our faith, but at Jesus, its author and finisher. In order to know God personally and intimately, you have to know Jesus. You have to see Jesus. You have to realize who he is, what he came to do, and how he accomplished the purpose that God intended for him when he first volunteered in heaven saying, Whom shall we send? And he said, Here am I. Send me. And so God did. The Father sent the Son to reveal who the Father was because man had so confused the issue that they had no idea who God was or what God is, or how God operated. So the Son came to reveal that to mankind. And mankind didn't understand that. And in no way, shape, or form really completely comprehended that until Jesus said, once I have gone to the Father and He will send the Comforter, then He shall reveal the truth. He shall cause you to remember all things whatsoever I taught you and he will reveal to you those things that I have said and he will explain them to you for the spirit of truth will come and he will be your comforter he will come alongside you he will teach you he will guide you he will abide with you he will give you gifts he will be and produce inside your life fruit that would be unto God for the glory that he has accomplished and Jesus promised that he would ask the father to send them and as the Spirit of God is here with us. When He comes in us, He causes us to understand spiritual things, for we would not know or see or comprehend Jesus except that the Spirit of God reveal Him to us. So even as the Father is revealed by the Son, the Son is revealed by the Spirit of God. So the three being cooperatively revealed in one, we see Jesus and we have seen it all. We know Jesus and we know it all. We ask Jesus and we can find it all. All we need to do is seek Jesus and to reveal 
and to be revealed as his followers, doing those things that, like he did with his father, only those things that were pleasing in his sight, we do only those things that are pleasing in Jesus' sight. So what are those things that we ought to be doing so that we represent God properly? Take a Bible, open it up, start reading the words in red. I think you'll find that Jesus was very specific about what he said to do, how he said to live, and what he said to be. And I think you could boil it down to, in a very simple word, love. Because God is love. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that knoweth, loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So the essence of the volume of the book, of the Bible itself from cover to cover, boils down to love. If you are loving your enemies, if you are loving your friends, if you are loving your neighbor, if you are loving your wife, if you are loving your children, you are loving those that persecute you, you are loving those that miserably use you, you are loving those all around you with the kind of love that God said He would create in you, then you are born of God and you know God and God is that revelation of Himself in you to other people because you love them, irregardless of the circumstances that you find yourself in or that they portray themselves to be to you. For even as Jesus died on the cross, love was manifested in the words he said to them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There is no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life. And Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And since he laid down his life for the world, we know he laid down his life for everyone. And there isn't one person that we can't love. Whether he take a life, whether he take a wife, whether he take a child, whether he molest a child, whether he be living or dead, there isn't one person that we couldn't in some way do as Jesus said to do. Forgive them, for they know not what they do.